And of course, even if, even if Stu's most optimistic scenario comes true, uh, the economy is still underperforming. It's growing under 3% under his scenario, and I think most of us are, are in that boat. So who's going to save us? And the answer for some people is, has been, for the last five years, the Fed. <laughs> so let's bring in somebody who really knows the Fed very well, Bill Poole, who is a very, very uh, well-known scholar, but uh, was uh, president of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis for uh, a, a lot of years before he was forced out by being too old. <laughs> so, Bill, let us, uh, let us have your views about that. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm going to put some uh, very long period charts uh, up here and let's make sure I'm doing this the right direction. Maybe not. What am I doing wrong? Well, I'm not doing anything wrong. <laughs> I'm doing, I'm taking instruction. Okay, try. Now we'll try it. There we go. Okay. So here are the issues. Um, and uh, the Fed's portfolio is bloated, and uh, how does the Fed return to its uh, pre-crisis uh, operating mode, which more or less emphasizing control of interest rates. So there's the portfolio, and it keeps going up. The taper has reduced the growth, but it continues to grow, and we're headed up towards, where are we here, um, four and a half trillion. And uh, to get the portfolio back to uh, have a more normal operating mode, they'll have to go back to about one and a half, let's say. Now, we have historically low interest rates. Um, but what I think, you, and everybody is aware of this fact, but here's the chart that I think you really need to look at, uh, something like this. Uh, this only goes, I picked this off the internet, it goes back to 1831, uh, and it only goes up to 19, uh, I mean, sorry, 2010, so it doesn't have the tail off to the right. There is only one other period in U.S. history, only one other period with interest rates this low, this long, and it's the Great Depression. It's the Great Depression. Um, and I would make a general statement. When you see very, very low interest rates for a prolonged period of time, that the reason is invariably, maybe I should be careful, almost invariably, that there are problems with uh, policy, uh, real factors, uh, non-monetary, non-financial factors are responsible for this situation. And that's what I think is the key to understanding the situation. This uh, problem of slow growth, high unemployment, is not something that the Federal Reserve can fix. Uh, I put this one on, it's a weakest recovery since World War II. Um, and if you look carefully at the uh, recession bars on here, you'll see that uh, the economy has always returned to the peak level of employment in a few quarters. Uh, we're still not back. We're still not back. Uh, this is by far the weakest recovery since World War II. So why? What, what's going on here? And I think the absolute key thing to focus on is the slow recovery of business fixed investment. Now, it, it's what I've done here is to take the uh, series off the St. Louis Fed website, which is the, uh, the, B the um, uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis series, on a quantity index for investment. There are problems, big index number problems, uh, and I think this is the best uh, series that you can have over a very long period. So here again, we have the situation that business fixed investment has not yet gotten back to the um, cycle peak level. 
And many parts of the economy have gotten back, housing obviously not, but many parts of the economy have gotten back, like automobiles and uh, con consumption, but business fixed investment is not back. So that's the most important single thing to look at. And why is business fixed investment not back? It certainly has nothing to do with uh, financial constraints, nothing whatsoever to do with financial constraints. It has to do with constraints that are coming from the uh, fears that entrepreneurs have that investment will not yield a rate of return sufficient to cover the cost of capital. It also has to do, by the way, with regulatory constraints. I, the uh, poster child on this is the uh, president's refusal to license the Keystone XL pipeline, but there are many other uh, uh, there are many other regulatory constraints on development. So the, there are lots of entrepreneurs that want to build stuff, particularly in the energy area. They can't get the permits to do it. They can't get the permits. And so that has stalled the recovery of this very uh, long uh, duration capital that you have with uh, pipelines, for example, and there are other examples. Uh, uh, LNG exports would be a good example. Uh, those terminals are expensive, uh, and we have a big export business waiting for us. The government won't grant the permits to go ahead. Just that simple. Okay, the FOMC's uh, job one. And, and I'll let you um, read. So the Fed can't fix the problems that are wrong with the economy. The Fed could make a contribution, the Fed leadership could make a contribution, if the Fed would be candid about what the problems are. Now certain members of the FOMC have spoken quite openly about these issues, and I would mention particularly um, Charlie Plosser from uh, this fair city and uh, some others, uh, but the Fed leadership has been uh, absolutely silent uh, on this uh, problem of the uh, real constraints on economic growth. Okay, now, job two. The FOMC does not have uh, an articulated policy strategy. And I would say over a medium term, three to five years. And part of the reason that they have not uh, expressed a strategy to us is that they don't have one worked out internally either. The Fed doesn't really know. It is responding day by day or month by month would be a little bit more fair uh, to the data, but without any uh, coherent framework that would help us in the markets to figure out where things are going. And the Fed needs to emphasize the difference between the strategy and the individual policy actions that are taken within the strategy. And I've mentioned here, as, uh, as Dunk did, uh, the issue of communications. Uh, the Fed communications uh, from, the, uh, from the leadership, uh, Bernanke before Yellen, uh, is a random disturbance onto the economy. It produces uh, unhelpful, uh, unwelcome fluctuations in security prices. Now, here's two easy things that the Fed could do. The, the, the subject that gets the most discussion is having a strategy that's built around a Taylor rule or something like that, and that's pretty difficult. But there are things that the Fed could do to make its operations more predictable. Uh, and here's, here are two of them. One, the Fed could commit to adjust the federal funds rate in 25 basis point increments. That's not a big deal, <clears throat> unless there is some really dramatic event that would call for a bigger adjustment. That'd be a very simple thing to do, and that would help to uh, cement more clear expectations in the marketplace about Fed behavior. You wouldn't find speculation that the Fed would be doing a much bigger move in the normal, everyday course of business. Um, and then also, the Fed ought to confine its decisions to the time of FOMC meetings, the practice uh, from time to time to have decisions between meetings 
is uh, disruptive, it creates market expectations. Uh, well, are they going to come in or aren't they? Um, and by and large, there is no good purpose served unless there is some very extreme event, such as the stock market crash in 1987 or 9 -1 -1. I mean, we get those things on occasion, but they're rare. Okay, now the, the portfolio unwind. The Fed should proceed to uh, complete the, uh, the taper. It's been reducing its purchases by $10 billion. Uh, I would have preferred when they started to have gone faster, but they didn't. So they just need now to complete it. And it's a mistake for Yellen to say that the policy is, how does she put it, uh, not preset. Well, what, what Yellen ought to say is, we uh, have started down the road of reducing our purchases by $10 billion. We intend, intend to continue that and unless there is some major disruption that would call for uh, a different policy response. Why doesn't, why doesn't she simply say that? In fact, there are market expectations that the Fed will continue, and interrupting is going to cause a, a lot of questions. What are they doing? Why, why would they do such a thing? So why doesn't the Fed simply acknowledge? Why doesn't the Fed simply acknowledge that that's the track it's on? The Fed should then commit uh, sooner rather than later, that it will let the portfolio run off. That's the least disruptive thing it can do, and it would just stop reinvesting uh, maturing principal and interest. And when you look at the data, uh, the, given the maturity distribution of the Fed's holdings of treasuries, uh, the treasury portfolio would be back to about uh, 1.5 trillion in five years if they did that. That's, that's how long it would take. Um, and there might be a, a way of going faster, but at any rate, they could commit now to do that, and that would help to get that whole issue out of the way, get it out of the way. Why leave it hanging? There's no good reason to leave it hanging. Do I expect that this is the way they'll go? No, I do not. Uh, despite the logic that to me is compelling, and I would guess that uh, Charlie Plosser uh, would also agree with, and some of my other former colleagues in the Fed would agree, no, I don't think that the Fed will go this route because the Fed wants to keep all options open. The Fed seems to believe that that's a good way to run monetary policy. I think it's entirely uh, unhelpful. Okay, four. Now, the forward guidance. So the Fed has been pushing this uh, idea of providing advance notice on what it's going to be doing with its uh, federal funds rate policy, its interest rate policy. And I believe that this um, policy is uh, risky and is at some point uh, going to get them into trouble. And it's got them into trouble for a couple reasons. Uh, when you, we're gonna, I'm going to put this dot diagram up in a minute. The dot diagram is the projections uh, of the FOMC participants as to where the federal funds rate is going to be at the end of each year. Now, uh, these are the projections that are released for the uh, real economy and, and for the inflation rate. These are the ones released at the March meeting. And these are released right before the uh, chairs, she prefers to be chair yelling, the chairs um, press conference. Now, when you look at the minutes, they will also release a table that shows uncertainty, projections uncertainty. Nobody seems to pay any attention to this. Uh, the FOMC itself and the staff uh, presentations emphasizes the importance of projections errors, the importance of these errors historically. So even in 2014, th this is at the, um, in the minutes for the March meeting, j just uh, released, what, last week or a few days ago. So the projection for 2014, they're telling us uh, for GDP, plus or minus 1.6 percentage points. 1.6 percentage points. That's a very large range. 
And as you go out <coughs> farther, of course, the projections have an even wider uh, confidence interval. So clearly, if the economy were to perform on the high side of the center point, the best guess, there would be a policy response. And that's what is missing from the, uh, from the dot diagram that I'm gonna, <clears throat> that I'm gonna get to in a moment. So this sort of summarizes uh, this table, again, this page which you can read, uh, at least I hope you can read it back there, <clears throat> of the implications um, of the forecast uncertainty that the FOMC tells us. Now there is no table presented for the uncertainty about the uh, federal funds rate. Uh, that they don't discuss. But clearly it's an implication that there's gonna be uncertainty about that if there's uncertainty about the uh, way the real economy is gonna go and the inflation rate as well. Okay, so clearly the markets are gonna respond if there are outcomes uh, on the high side or the low side. Now what's happened since the recovery started in mid-2009 is that the economy has come in consistently on the low side of projections. And therefore, the FOMC has maintained rates down at zero for longer than they had anticipated at the beginning of this process. And that's been an ongoing process uh, even to this day the, uh, you know, the most recent outcomes are coming in below what they had expected. So interest rates are remaining lower than people would have anticipated. But that's not going to continue forever. Eventually, <clears throat> we're going to have a surprise on the upside. There's the famous dot diagram. Now, here we are. Let's see. Is this? There we go. So this is now 2014. Uh, so this is the dot diagram uh, released at the time of the meeting and just before the press conference uh, last month. So most participants think the rate is going to remain here. Only one thinks it's here. But clearly, there uh, has to be uncertainty. And the individual members, uh, participants, understand that uncertainty. And they would tell you, if you press them, they would tell you well, yeah, this is all subject to revision depending on how the economy comes out. Uh, and so that's why this dot diagram is really uh, sort, sort of dangerous because it provides a sense, and as I read market commentary, the market seems to be really quite convinced that there will not be any action uh, to move the federal funds rate until next year. Um, but if there are upside surprises, that's going to change pretty quickly. It, it, it ought to change anyway. Okay. Um, so this is, the, the dot diagram presents the best guess. Now doesn't Fed transparency call for a clear statement about the uncertainty over the projections on the federal funds rate? Uh, I know that that's what they believe. They have to believe it. Why doesn't the Fed talk about that? and explain to the market that, uh, yes, this po these policy projections are all the central best guesses, but it's going to be revised if the economy comes in uh, either slower or stronger than forecast. Okay. Um, now, an astute journalist should have asked the question that I'm going to give you in a moment. Um, and, and this is a question I just asked. Why doesn't a journalist confront Yellen with this question? It would be very easy to do, and it would come from the materials that the FOMC itself distributes. Um, I don't know what, how she would answer it. I don't know. But she ought to be confronted with this question in some public forum, uh, either in that press conference or uh, during congressional testimony. Okay, um, I'm, this is just continuing. I'm assuming you can uh, read faster than I can uh, punch the clicker button here. So, we're gonna have, uh, we have the risk 
uh, of market turmoil ahead of us as the Fed uh, normalizes uh, the risk because of the risk, uh, normal risk, uh, of projection errors in the economy coming in in a different direction. Uh, and it's not, it doesn't have to be a very big error for the market to start to say, hey, wait a minute, um, the, the FOMC's going to have to be moving faster if we're lucky enough to have it on the high side. Um, and as I say, as I said before, the uh, outcomes have been consistently below projection in recent years, but that's not going to uh, change. That's not going to continue forever. Okay. Thank you. And uh, are we doing the next discussion first? Then, okay. And then um, turn the clicker over. Oh, this, uh, one more thing. Th this is where we're going to be. There we go. Okay. And <laughs> okay. And now a local talent. <laughs> Not a local talent, we'll see that. <laughs> you check his resume, you see he spent time working at the Fed before he joined this esteemed faculty. So you should be set. Andre? Thank you. All yours. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, for having me on this program, it's a it's a pleasure to uh, speak here. Um, of course, Bill Poole is a tough act to follow, but uh, I'll do my best. So, um, I guess we heard already, and we all know that uh, U.S. monetary policy has changed dramatically during the financial crisis and the ensuing uh, Great Recession, as it's sometimes called. And the topic of this session, and then I guess the question in many people's mind is, when and how will monetary policy return to normal? So I'm going to take a slightly different tack here because, as I said, Bill Poole is a hard act to follow, so I'm going to uh, take a, a slightly different route. My key message of my talk is the Fed is unlikely to return to normal, at least the way we define normal from past uh, uh, operating experience. And my claim here, or my message, is based on three observations on which I will elaborate in this talk. Fed introduced new policy tools during the, uh, during the crisis. I think a lot of people inside the Fed think they were rather successful, and the Fed is likely to use them again in the future if, if need arises. Now, of course, the conditional is if need arises. So. Um, observation two, there are several issues with re reducing the balance sheet back to pre-crisis levels. Observation three, the Fed is currently experimenting with a new operating framework that allows it to manage the balance sheet independently of the policy rate. Now, before I elaborate on these observations, let me make two qualifications. Um, the first is new policy tools are not only the balance sheet expansion. We heard about forward guidance, and uh, I, I agree with uh, uh, basically everything that uh, Bill Poole said on that in terms of uh, that uh, increased transparency and uh, 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 communication about future actions being maybe more confusing at times than, than not, and that creating additional volatility. Um, but uh, I guess uh, I don't have much more to say on this, so I, I'll leave it at that. Uh, also, the Fed has, uh, in terms of new policy, has, uh, has received a lot of new supervi uh, supervisory uh, um, uh, roles or, or responsibilities, which uh, um, I think will, sh will change quite a bit um, how the Fed will be perceived, uh, aside from monetary policy. Uh, the second observation I want to make is that what I do here is mostly a description of the issues that the Fed, are fa uh, the Fed is facing. I don't want this to be uh, uh, a recommendation of, of what the Fed ought to be doing. I think it's more of a description of what it thinks uh, that it does. And with that, I guess I should also say that um, this is in no way a reflection of, of, what, uh, of uh, what my former employer thinks uh, about all these things or at least not necessarily. That's the usual language. Okay, so, so with that, um, with those qualifications, let me uh, show you a, a plot that uh, uh, Bill Poole has already shown, which is uh, the balance sheet expansion, or you could also call it explosion that happened since 2008. Um, and uh, the, so the balance sheet right now uh, stands at somewhere between 4.2 and 4.5 trillion. It's expected to go up to 4.5 trillion. And it happened in two big uh, chunks. The first was uh, during the actual crisis, lending to financial institutions and providing 
liquidity to markets, which then, as you can see, that's the gray and the, the blue part, that was drawn down relatively quickly, and that's back to more or less normal levels. The other part, which we are all, always talking about now, is the expansion in terms of purchasing uh, mortgage-backed securities and longer-term treasuries, uh, long, um, uh, LSAP sometimes called, uh, large-scale asset purchases. And, and this, is, uh, this is the main concern. Um, let me just put some more information to the yellow and the brown part. So the, the yellow part, which is the treasury portfolio, together with the, the orange part, I guess that's more traditional, shorter-term security holdings, that represents um, about, according to my calculations, about 18% of the, federally, of the federal debt held by the public. Um, and the brown part, the MBS, uh, represents about 20%, according to my calculations, of total agency and GSE-backed um, uh, uh, stock of MBS. So these are, these are large percentages, uh, but they're not you know, anywhere close to, I don't know, 80% or whatever. Uh, uh, that, uh, I guess, would be a, a bigger concern in terms of market functioning. I, I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, also, an, another side note, last year alone, the, the Fed accounted for 70% uh, of purchases of all net issuance of the U.S. Treasury. Uh, so uh, at least in terms of flow, uh, there, there's quite a lot of influence. But uh, that's more of a side note. So, you know, how should we think about these uh, large uh, or, or these, these balance sheet expansions? So on the lending to financial t institutions and liquidity program side, I think uh, that's generally considered a success uh, in, in the sense that it kept key parts of the financial system from collapsing during the, the dark days of 2008 and 2009, and uh, the unwinding generated profits for the taxpayer. Uh, uh, one example is AIG uh, holdings that were uh, done through the Fed. Um, at least the, the Fed part created, uh, created quite a windfall. Um, of course, there are moral hazard implications that you should be concerned about, but they're very difficult to quantify. Is there additional risk-taking that financial institutions do because they think that overall they'll be bailed out again in the future? That is something that uh, uh, should be on everyone's mind and certainly on the policymakers' mind. But in terms of judging those programs to be a success, I think the Fed would do it again uh, in, in, if, if something like that happened in the future. Um, so that, that adds to my observation number one here, I guess. Um, about large-scale asset purchases, the MBS portfolio and, and, and the treasuries. So there's a lot of research inside the Fed and among academics that, have tri that has tried to be very careful in terms of uh, trying to use event studies or, or, or a sophisticated uh, econometric methods to tease out what are the effects really on, 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 on yields on MBS and, and treasuries. And overall, I'm showing you here a table. You don't need to look at all the details. I'm just showing you that there's a lot of, a lot of research that has been done overall. The, the conclusion of these studies is that, yes, it had an impact in lowering yields. So uh, if you look at the, the last column here, the estimated effect of uh, $600 billion in LSAPs uh, is, you know, depending on the study, 15 to 20 basis points maybe. There's a lot of uncertainty around that. But if you take that midpoint and sort of extrapolate it out, uh, some studies conclude it could be as much as 100 basis points. Okay, so conclusion is from a lot of research that there was some effect. Now, that gets me to one of uh, Bill Poole's and, and before uh, um, uh, comments by uh, uh, Bill. Um, you know, what is the effect of that on the macroeconomy? Low rates. And there I'm much more pessimistic uh, in agreement uh, with, with, with what we heard um, in, in terms of uh, the economy being in a bad spot. That's mostly a real problem. Uh, Businesses not wanting to invest because they're, they have a negative outlook or uh, are subject to a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and so this may just be pushing on a string. And, uh, and I guess that's the bigger question. But in terms of whether it had low rates, I think uh, you know, the outlook in, or, or the, the research says it's, it's not too bad. Okay? Now, so there's, there's some success story there too. Of course, there are potential costs and risks of these LSAPs. Uh, some people have argued that this may impair market functioning. I don't know the details of, of the markets so well, but the numbers I told you before, holding about eight, you know, the Fed holds about 18% of the whole treasury market um, and about 20% of, the, of these particular types of MBSs. I don't know whether that's a big impairment to market functioning, but I, I leave that up to, to experts uh, maybe in this room. Um, 
People have also argued it may encourage excessive risk taking uh, be, uh, through the search for higher yields. Although recent research again says that uh, in, in terms of uh, 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 event studies, when, when the Fed announced these quantitative easing uh, programs, that risk didn't go up by, uh, uh, by different asset prices uh, for, for, for uh, uh, CDOs, for example. Um, now, another issue may be that it may decrease Fed profits in the future as, as they have to, uh, as they, as they, uh, have to pay uh, interest on reserves, a thing I will come back if they want to uh, draw down that portfolio in a slow and orderly fashion. And I would argue here that this is mostly a political risk because we should not forget that the Fed during the last four years has had record remittances to the Treasury, which are double to triple what they usually would do. Uh, and so having lower remittances because of lower profits in the future, uh, in a present value sense, I don't think is a big issue. Uh, I would argue that uh, uh, total remittances may very well be higher than if they hadn't done any of this. Um, but there are political risks that we have all heard about. There's already senators of, of different bands who are positioning themselves to try to uh, go after the Fed when the time comes and remittances go below the historical average. Uh, so, so that remains to be seen. And, of course, there may be a destabilizing effect during exit if, say, the Fed tried to uh, sell off uh, some of these portfolio holdings quickly. Um, but overall, uh, my observation, uh, one stands, I think, uh, the Fed thinks these, these policy tools are, 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 have generally been a success in lowering rates, and the costs are hard to quantify, and so if, if need arises in the future, they will do that again. Okay? And so I, I think... That, to think that the operating uh, status quo will be what it was before 2008 is, is, is maybe not a good, a good assumption here. Okay. okay, so with that being said, let me go on and think about how conventional monetary policy going forward would actually happen. Um, right, we always talk about, uh, well, the Fed funds rate will go up at some point, maybe in 2008. But we, let's, let's think a little bit caref more carefully about this. Um, in fact... Uh, this policy tightening, if it happens in 2008, it will almost surely take place in an environment of abundant liquidity, meaning where the banking sector as a whole will have excess reserves, give or take, of $3 trillion. Uh, $3 trillion okay? So what do you mean there to increase the Fed funds rate? Right? Because that should be the marginal cost on holding excess reserves in the banking system. Um, and uh, b before I go and think about this more carefully, let me just show you a little bit a projection that I took from a recent paper by Joe Gagnon and Brian Sachs. Gagnon was at the Fed, uh, and so was Brian Sachs. He was, in fact, the, the head of the New York Fed market desk for, for uh, uh, the, the time during the crisis. So what they show here in, in terms of the, the, the dark green line, that's assets or liability total of the Fed. And the reserves part, that's what you should think of excess liquidity in the system. And you can see that this is projected to go up until 2015, give or take. Uh, this is in terms of percent of GDP, but at its peak, it would be about $3 trillion. And then because the maturity of these MBSs and treasuries are relatively long, the drawdown would, if, if they would just stop uh, uh, reinvesting the proceeds, uh, as, as Bill uh, argued, they should do starting somewhere in 2015. Uh, and if, of course, the, the additional purchases that they're still doing are being drawn down by the end of 2014, the, the drawdown of, the, of these excess reserves will be relatively slow. And it's projected here to happen only by mid-2020, uh, to the extent where we would be back to the regular uh, you know, portfolio where there's maybe a total of 30 billion or 20 billion of reserves in the system and only about 1.5 to 2 billion in excess reserves in the system, okay, which was the case before 2008. Okay, so this is the situation, right? At the peak, that's where we are saying the Fed funds rate should go up or is expected to go up. But you have to understand the Fed's market, uh, the Fed funds market, that's, uh, right, the Fed funds rate, is a, it's, a, it's a rate on overnight loans between depository institutions um, and the Fed has in the past regulated or targeted that rate by uh, controlling the supply of reserves. So that banks, uh, uh, in, the, in the search for reserves that they needed to have to fulfill their requirements, uh, they, uh, that demand, uh, um, uh, together with supply, determined the Fed funds rate. But, and so I should say, that then the Fed funds rate was the marginal cost for lending uh, uh, for depository institutions. 
But with abundant liquidity, it's no longer relevant, right? If, if everyone has excess reserves, then you know, drawing the amount of total reserves back to, say, 2.5 trillion is just not going to have any effect in itself. So what else is the Fed planning to do? Well, one instrument they have already introduced, um, which is, um, well, not before I go to these instruments, let me just say one solution that we could think of is the Fed could just try to drain a lot of the liquidity quickly, meaning draw down that portfolio within a couple of months. But uh, I guess there I would argue that uh, uh, this could have destabilizing effects on the market. If all of a sudden the Fed dumps 20% on the treasury market, uh, I, I don't think that uh, that would go uh, over without a hitch. Uh, uh. So um, the other thing that, that we should also say is that the longer maturity treasuries and MBS do not necessarily have the same liquidity properties in terms of the bank's balance sheets and, uh, for, for regulatory purposes that, say, for the SEC when they look at liquidity ratios. And so that may be another issue that, that, that would come up there. Um, now, so what can the Fed do instead uh, in, in this uh, environment? Um, uh, well, they, uh, they, can, uh, they can go down, uh, they can use other instruments. Um, and... Um, Instead of, uh, in, instead of trying to reduce the, the, the Fed balance sheet quickly, which is uh, my observation too here. So what are these other uh, operational tools once th one day introduced in 2008, which is interest on reserves? So the Fed now uh, pays interest on reserves. Uh, so by, by doing so, they could just raise that, and that's often being mentioned. Um, no arbitrage implies then that the Fed funds rate and other short-term interest rates should remain close to this IOR rate. Um, uh, and, and there's, there's some issues with that in, in practice, uh, and I will show you some graphs in, in a second. Uh, turns out that this IOR rate is, is not, uh, or, or the other short-term rates, I should say, are not as closely linked currently to this IOR rate. And that issue may become even worse. We just don't know once we go off the zero lower bound. Right? We, right now with the IOR, we only have uh, experience of how it behaves relative to other rates uh, at the zero lower bound where things are constricted anyway. So let me show you some pictures about that. So here is in red, that's the IOR, which was introduced in 2008. At some point, it was at 1% uh, during the crisis. And then since uh, uh, 2009, it's been at 0 0.25. Okay? The other lines uh, are the green is a uh, treasury bill rate uh, for a short-term treasury. Um, uh, the, the, the dark blue line is the Fed funds rate. Um, and you can see they're not that closely together. Uh, in fact, if I zoom in on 2009 forward, this is here, there's movement around. And so why would that be the case? Well, uh, that depends about, a lot about understanding the functioning of the Fed funds rate. But in one word, it has to do with uh, limited competition in, in, in that market. Um, and uh, it can also have to do with, with, with costs that come uh, uh, of doing that arbitrage, saying trying to uh, borrow reserves uh, from other uh, institutions and then getting the IOR on your holdings. And so uh, I, I, uh, I recommend the Gagnon Sock paper and, and some other literature that is mentioned in there if you want to have details. The, the key point for you is that IOR may not be that good of a tool for the Fed to control precisely what the rate should be, the short-term rate. Which brings me to another operational tool uh, that the Fed is currently experimenting with, which is called the, the uh, Reverse Repurchase Facility, or RP, RRP, um, in which uh, the Fed sells security to uh, the banking system in exchange for reserves and promises to buy it back uh, at a fixed price in the future. So basically, the Fed in this case would be the borrower, uh, and it would be a, a, a stand-in for IOR, uh, just with collateral behind it. Okay. Um, the big difference here would be that this reverse repurchase facility would be available to a broader set of market participants, and that should help having a, a more competitive environment and therefore a, a cleaner control uh, for the Fed, in particular if the Fed allows that uh, RRP to happen as what is called a full allotment facility, meaning where it sets the rate and allows market participants to participate in as much dollars as they want. There, there would be no cap. Okay, and so that, as I said, should put a firmer floor on, 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 lending, on short-term lending rates and, and could therefore be an, an instrument that, uh, uh, that, that would be worth trying out. Okay. Um, it would, I, in terms of advantages, it would shift the focus of monetary policy directly uh, to the control of a short-term interest rate. 
uh, rather than trying to manage the quantity of reserves in the system. Um, it would uh, also reflect that a large portion of credit creation is intermediated not through uh, depository institution, but a broader set of financial market participants. And uh, it would, and that's the key here, uh, I guess that is also true with IOR, it would allow the Fed to manage the balance sheet independently while maintaining better control of the short-term interest rate. Okay. And finally, uh, I mentioned this briefly, it might help financial institutions in, in fulfilling regulatory requirements uh, in terms of liquidity coverage ratios. Because, again, uh, uh, treasuries and certainly MBS, uh, longer-term treasuries, but certainly MBS don't have the same liquidity properties. And, and so having a lot of liquidity in the system may actually be a good thing. Okay? Now, that's an interesting, an interesting proposal. It's not one that grew on my, uh, on my pile. Uh, instead, the, the Fed has been thinking about this for quite a long time and quite hard. And starting in September 2013, they uh, introduced a uh, testing facility of this. Um, where currently there's uh, their, their maximum daily bids of seven billion per counterparty at five basis points, and the daily volume is around 100 billion. So they're experimenting with the market functioning of this RRP facility, and, uh, and, and so that's, that's an interesting case. Of course, there are issues uh, associated with this. Um, RRP is basically an extension of interest on reserves, just for a broader set of market participants. But then the question is, what should IOR be, right? Uh, is there, how do you set IOR uh, relative to RRP if you don't want to have arbitrage happening? Um, uh, how should the Fed communicate this new framework, especially in the current situation where markets are jittery about tightening, right? If all of a sudden the Fed says, well, now we're going to use RRP in the future, uh, then there may be all kinds of uh, uncertainty about how exactly that would happen. And, uh, and, and finally, uh, the Fed would need to maintain a large balance sheet of treasuries because if you have a full allotment facility, you have to be there with maximum firepower to give as much as the, as the market wants. Uh, and, so, uh, and, and so that would then uh, maybe lead to all the political costs in case these rates would have to be very high and remittances as a result would go down. But observation three, uh, which I'm making here, stands. I think the Fed is experimenting uh, or thinking very seriously about a new operating framework that may or may not matter for you, but the bottom line is it's, a, it's, it's an operating framework that would allow the Fed to keep the balance sheet high for a relatively long time, and maybe even permanently so. And uh, uh, there are risks associated with that, but uh, it's not an unlikely, an unlikely scenario. So that's uh, basically my conclusion here. It's uh, the Fed's monetary policy is unlikely to return to normal. Um, of course, this is on top of things already mentioned. Uh, this move of the Fed towards greater transparency in policymaking, which is, uh, in theory, something that makes total sense, right? If you can commit uh, to something and be very clear about your objectives you commit to, then your policy becomes more effective. But in reality, that's more complicated because committing to something is not so easy. And the Fed has shown this recently when they backed away from thresholds, for example. And then important responsibility in terms of financial supervision. I think that's, that's there. I've seen this happening at the Fed where the Fed has expanded. Sometimes you joke the Fed is, the lend, uh, is not only the lender of last resort, but the employer of last resort because they hired so many new PhDs and, 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 and lawyers and so forth to, to take on that task of supervisory uh, uh, regulation. And that's something that's going to politicize the Fed. They're going to co-own any new, uh, any new um, crisis that could happen because if they signed off on, on, uh, on um, uh, banks being in good shape then, and, and that, that turns out not to be true, then, then there will be a problem. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Andre, thank you very much. Let's invite President Poole back up. Lots of time for – I thought I heard kind of uh, in, the, uh, in the discussion – the notion that the Fed can, we just showed that Fed could lower interest rates, but it may not matter. <laughs> Did I hear that? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, least, basically. Uh, anyway, anyway so don't, don't, we're going to open the floor John, for. Could, yeah, could, could I make a couple uh, quick comments? Sure. Okay. Why not? Uh, we, we had yeah, a good discussion uh, last night, and w one of the things we discussed was that uh, the Fed's large balance sheet will imply large payments of interest to the banks. And that could easily become a uh, political hot potato 
when the because the bankers uh, you know they're not the most uh, favored uh, constituency in this uh, in this economy or any economy uh, or any time historically. The big bankers. Uh, well, I think even I think even <laughs> I, I, any bankers. Okay. Um, so one of the reasons that the Fed uh, I think is is likely to work down its balance sheet is it doesn't want to leave itself exposed to that political risk of paying literally scores and scores of billions of dollars to the banks. Now, a, a couple other things that I want to comment on. Um, you, you commented that the Fed's emergency powers were widely uh, considered a success. Uh, there are two important changes, actually, that have taken place. One is the Dodd-Frank has limited uh, to a degree the Fed's uh, room to use its emergency authority under what was Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act. So the Federal Reserve does not have quite the freedom of action that it did in 2008. But perhaps even more importantly, the Bloomberg suit requiring disclosure of all Fed lending, including discount window lending, after two years, uh, that, and that was, uh, the Fed fought that. But we now have, for the first time, the Fed is required to disclose. So the, let's say, GE Capital, uh, which uh, borrowed money through the commercial paper facility from the Fed in uh, 2008, a GE Capital and other such firms, knowing that the borrowing will be disclosed in two years, are going to be much more reticent uh, to go to the Fed than they were before. I'm not saying that this is a good thing, but I'm saying it's a fact as a consequence of the Bloomberg suit and that it's something to be uh, aware of. Um, now, Fed, you called it profits. Let me just call it surplus. Um, <laughs> keep, keep in mind that the Treasury could have done exactly the same thing. If the Treasury had decided to stop issuing all long-term debt and finance all of the maturing issues and the new deficit with 90-day Treasury bills. The Treasury could have dramatically shortened the maturity of the outstanding debt, and given the term structure and how things have evolved, that would have dramatically reduced the Treasury's cost of financing the debt. So what the Fed has done, of course, is to take all the interest rate risk of financing uh, the United States government uh, uh, really at demand because bank reserves are demand liabilities of the of the federal government. Um, you're absolutely right, and I did not uh, dwell on it that the um, that the federal funds rate uh, is not going to be the only policy instrument, and that the Fed will have to pay interest on reserves because federal funds are just uh, reserves. So those two rates will move together. The uh, the reverse RPs are potentially another uh, confusing element of policy. The Fed has used re reverse RPs uh, for many years as a normal part of its uh, monetary policy operation when it wanted to uh, absorb reserves on a temporary basis. But now the Fed is, has another policy instrument. Suppose that the Fed were to, uh, let's say, offer two-week uh, reverse RPs, two-week maturity. Suppose that the Fed decides to increase that rate, but not increase the Fed funds rate. But what sort of a signal will that send to the market? Well, I don't know what sort of a signal it will send to the market, but there's a, 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 a term structure at the short end as well as from short paper out to 20-year bonds. So if the Fed starts playing around with that price that it will offer with reverse RPs, it's going to be sending what kind of signals? Well, who knows? And the Fed will find itself quite tangled up in trying to figure out what sort of signals it is sending and wants to send. So those are some uh, quick comments on your presentation. Let, let me just have one quick, uh, Go ahead. quick reaction. Um, so for the reverse RPs, I think they should be overnight. Uh, they, should, they shouldn't have a, a longer duration yeah. because of exactly the issue. Yeah. But the said. Fed has talked about establishing yeah. Yeah. a term facility yeah. Yeah. at which the banks can uh, place funds. And, and, and that's going to be a, a tricky issue. That would be very tricky. Yeah. 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 
The, the other thing that uh, I guess we discussed uh, briefly yesterday is that, well, Congress gave the Fed the authority to pay interest on reserves. Uh, it was supposed to be introduced not only in 2011, but with the crisis, it came in 2008. Uh, so one could be concerned that the Congress also may take away that authority again. Uh, I don't know what the political process is that much in detail to, to assess the likelihood of that. Um, but if that happened, then they would have to have another instrument uh, in, in a time when all of a sudden the banking sector wants to use some of these excess reserves to make, to make loans and, uh, and then the money multiplier starts to go up again. And so uh, this other instrument, RRP, uh, because it has been used uh, as part of the operating procedure in another way, but, but still, it, it may be more difficult to take away. And so I think it's, it's I find it interesting and, and in my personal opinion good that they're experimenting with this, with this new tool at this point and making it available to a broader uh, set of market participants, including money market funds. Because you want to support the GSEs. That's, that's the main beneficiary of the, uh, of the reverse RPs. So now you can well, see why, <laughs> why, all, why all my little small business owners are confused. <laughs> yeah. So we have a question yeah. starting yeah. back here at the, the table. Yes, sir. So this is kind of keying off of uh, that 1831 chart you showed at the beginning, uh, President Poole. One of the things that we've observed in the derivatives markets over the course of this year has been the greater focus on the Fed's stopping point for where they begin or where they end hiking interest rates rather than on the timing of the starting point. And if you take a look at Euro dollar futures in 2018, 2019, they've come in between 50 and 75 basis points. So in line with that, that chart you first showed, what's your perception of some intermediate term neutral policy rate? Is it that 4%, is it closer to 3%? Because it has huge market implications, I think be bigger than many of the other issues we've been talking about. Okay, l let me, I'm gonna answer this um, very quickly as follows. Um, historically, historically, the real rate of interest uh, as best we can determine on uh, long-term treasuries has been in the neighborhood of two and a half percent, close enough for government work. If you accept that the Fed is able to keep the inflation rate at two, then that means that in the long run, we would expect uh, long maturity treasuries to be in the neighborhood of four and a half. Now, obviously, there's all sorts of things that can uh, move that around. And then take your own pick as to what the term structure ought to look like to talk about where the short rate's going to be. So that's where we uh, might be headed. But that's only, we're only going to get there uh, if we have some reforms, I think, that increase the uh, security of returns and the expected rate, real rate of return uh, to investors. Uh, because historically, the United States has been a growing economy. And uh, except for the 1930s. So if we find ourselves uh, sort of trapped, not in secular stagnation coming from the market, but secular stagnation coming from dysfunction in Washington, then we could remain uh, below this sort of long run equilibrium for a very long time. Well, that's uh, Mickey, get a. Just, have, just don't give your talk. I won't. I, I, <laughs> Andre, uh, one point. You said that, okay, so the government earned huge windfall profits from, from the, the Fed did from bailing out AIG. Windfalls. And, yes. and I would not say it's windfall. Risk adjusted, it may have been very low or even negative. And I recommend all studies that look at rates of return the government earned off of AIG or the TARP be adjusted for risk, maybe using uh, a, CD, uh, a credit default swap measure at the time. Okay, Bill, um, on your dots, the Fed is- They're not my dots, okay. they were the Fed's dots. The, the <laughs> Fed is very careful to say, these are not our forecasts. And in your, when you, what they say is, it is our most appropriate, it is the most appropriate, our assessment of the most appropriate funds rate given conditions. And that, that is even more damning, because if you look at um, the, the end of 2016, when 
the Fed says the unemployment rate's going to get down to 5.5%, which they call full employment, and the GDP gap has, all but has disappeared, um, how can they rationalize um, a zero real funds rate as appropriate? I recently asked a prominent governor of the Federal Reserve, how do you justify a zero real funds rate when you're at full employment? And the governor responded and said, because we'll be still fighting economic headwinds. And I was polite and didn't respond to him. Unspecified headwinds. Since that was a question addressed to me. Yes. The, the nature of the DOT exercise, each FOMC participant is asked to <coughs> present uh, his or her view on appropriate monetary policy given his own, her own view of the monetary processes. And so it's all done on an individual basis, but per person, per person, it's meant to be my best forecast of what the appropriate policy is going to be at these various dates. And then those are put together in this diagram. So that's the nature of the exercise. But I think that the widespread interpretation in the market is that this is where the FOMC expects to be if the economy evolves according to the projections on the real side. Uh, because the real side projections are also done on a per participant basis. They're not an official FOMC projection, but it's for each participant in the process. Would you recommend that they show a grid of each individual FOMC member's forecast of the economy and their... My, 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 my view on this is that when you look at the uncertainties, so let's take the, the blue dot, the dots in the diagram are blue. So if you were to take each participant and ask the participant also to have a spread, let's say, of red dots, around his or her own blue dot, okay? Then you would have such a widespread that the forward guidance is useless. It's utterly <laughs> useless. And it draws attention away from what the important issue is. What is the strategy? How does the FOMC anticipate that it's gonna respond if this happens or that happens and that's the problem with it. it. Trying to forecast the future, well, forecast or, or do any of these projections on the federal funds rate is ignoring or drawing attention away from specification of what the FOMC strategy is. That's why I think it's a mistake. Okay, Stu, we'll. Yeah, the, the question about the interest on reserves, I, I believe that's actually interest on excess reserves. But uh, they're paid uh, right now at the same amount. Yeah. But they don't have to be. Yeah. But the Fed used to have a reserve requirement ratio that it used. We still do. It is too. But, <laughs> so why, and why not raise, I mean, you, Bill talked about, and, and we're doing some of our stress test exercise at PNC. What do you assume about the interest the Fed will pay on reserves. Will it move up with the Fed funds rate? Yes. Will there be an arbitrage? Or will the Fed cap it somewhat arbitrarily, because it is an administered rate, I think by the Board of Governors, for the reasons that Bill's concerned about, that they don't want to pay that much interest to us greedy bankers, and wouldn't it just be simpler to raise reserve requirements? Why, why not just say, instead of de minimis reserve requirements, 30 years ago, the, and those are against deposits, used to be 5% or 7%. Well, why not just say that banks have to hold 10 cents of every demand deposit and bring reserve requirements back up to levels they were 30 and 40 years ago, and then the Fed doesn't have to pay any interest on that, say those are not excess reserves, those are required reserves, and we pay zero interest on required reserves. So I think required reserve ratios could be a tool, but I haven't heard anyone talk about it back to the future of what the Fed did 30 or 40 years ago. Okay, let, let's first of all be very clear, and I'm not sure everybody here is, although I'm, I'm sure Stu is. Federal funds are reserves. 
the rates must be the same. Federal funds are nothing more than bank reserves that have been lent out in the interbank market. So those rates must be the same. Now, uh, th they're not the same now because there's also access to federal funds market by the GESEs and other participants that do not get interest on reserves. Um, I think it's true, and I have to go back and, and look at the law, but I don't think that the Fed has authority to raise reserve requirements m more than some amount. I think it's maybe 16 percent, but I'm not sure. And I don't think that's enough to absorb <clears throat> all the reserves that are sitting out there. So the Fed's going to have to bring those reserves down. Uh, it can't just increase required reserves and sop up all of the reserves sitting there. Uh, I mean, just as a rejoinder, suppose it could. Yeah, I think the reserve yeah. requirement ratio would have to be <laughs> north of 50 percent or something. I, I don't know. I, I, I would I'd guess. It would have to be re-legislated. You, you yeah. do both. If you put a liquidity coverage <coughs> ratio, why don't you just make banks hold sterile uh, <laughs> reserve deposits at the Fed that they can't yeah. do anything? I mean, so the, Fed, yeah. the Fed had sought authority to pay interest on reserves for many, many years. Uh, they finally got it in early September 2008, and I don't know whether that was accelerated. I mean, that was before Lehman that they, that they got the authority. Uh, and, and, I, and I don't think that it was a consequence of the financial crisis. The Fed sought that authority because uh, the, uh, the view was, I think the correct view is, that failure to pay interest on reserves is basically a tax on banks and it's not an efficient tax. So the Fed wanted to be able to pay interest on reserves for sort of efficient management purposes. And, and so I, I think that the banks would be uh, very, very resistant, to put it mildly, to a sharp increase in reserve requirements with zero interest. That would produce a political storm that the bank, that the Fed's not about to uh, tackle. And, and there's another, there's another economic Congress argument. Congress gave it, and Congress could take it away. And back in 07, banks were still good guys. Now we are the roots of all evil. So the general public and the Congress would be only too happy to see banks taxed by higher <laughs> returns. So I'm getting to the yeah. But let, let, let me make another economic point about this. So you could go all the way to the extreme. Why not have 100% reserve requirement? So. What would, what, do, what would that mean? It would mean that the Fed de facto decides what's the loan amount in the United States. And, and I think markets are better than the government, uh, even if the Fed is full of smart PhD economists, uh, to decide <laughs> how much loans there should be made in, an, in, in, a, in a system. And that's what fractional reserve banking is good at. It lets banks decide how many loans there should be outstanding. And uh, that's why I think it, it, it would be a blunt tool that works, I agree with you. Uh, but I, I think it wouldn't be a good tool at all for the U.S. economy. Okay, more questions. We got. All right, let's get the one over here, new, and then we'll go to you and you, and then we're going to break. Uh, thanks to both Dr. Kerman and uh, Dr. Poole for some very interesting observations. Uh, I wanted to get your opinion about the test facility, Dr. Kerman, that you had mentioned. Uh, starting in September 2013 about the ORRP and then Dr. Poole's comment about Fed funds rate versus that ORRP rate. Uh, considering that both of you have seen policies that you may never have imagined pre-2007, 2008, would the ORRP operation make sense uh, in the way that uh, the markets got conditioned to QE, you know, one, two, and three, and working through primary dealers. Would there not be some value to ORRP and are expecting that uh, in an unwinding process? So many terminal terms here, you know. I hope we're not getting too technical. The, the Fed used the reverse RP uh, before 2008 as a way of uh, pulling reserves out of the banking system. And they did it by having uh, bids for, you know, we need to take two, two billion out. So they would solicit bids, and they would take the most attractive bid. What they're talking about now is a posted rate, is a posted rate uh, available to all comers with suitable collateral. And so that would be uh, rather a different, rather different. And if you think about it, 
a posted rate uh, also in conjunction with the discount rate would put a band around the possible fluctuations of the federal funds rate or uh, interbank rates in general. And that might be an efficient way to run a short-run monetary policy. Let, let me add to that. Um, the, Fed, the Fed funds rate, or the Fed funds market in general, it, it wasn't a very, or it's not what we think of like a very pretty textbook market. It's an over-the-counter market. And if you look closely at what happens at the end of, or what happened at the end of a business day uh, across banks, they would call each other up and try to fulfill their reserve requirements and the other ones wanted to sell because they had excess. And the rates, they, I mean, they were within reasonable bands, but they were not the same among all the institutions. That's an inefficient way, I, I think, for the Fed to try to control the short rate. In, in addition to there being limited number of market participants. Uh, um, and so having a posted rate could be a much cleaner way for uh, a monetary authority to try to control short-term short lending. Um, in terms of the experience so far, it's from my, what is my understanding is that it's, it's quite a success. Um, market participants, they, uh, I mean, there's demand, about 100 billion uh, on a daily basis, and estimates, uh, if, the, if it would become a full allotment facility where bids can be unlimited, uh, I mean, the, the, the estimates go into the trillions. Uh, so it could, be, it could be an interesting market. Let's go there for a question, and then you can have the last question before the break. If any of the speakers this morning could comment on the um, impact European Union uh, or what's happening in Ukraine at the current time on mon monetary policy. Do you want to talk about that? You go ahead. <laughs> uh, all I know about Ukraine is what I read in the Wall Street Journal and the, and the New York Times. And my sense of it is that uh, Europe is, uh, is, is even less willing to take any action than the United States government is. And so, um, but I don't think it's a monetary policy issue at all, as best I can tell. Last question. Well, it's kind of a follow-up to that and then an actual question. If uh, the problem with Ukraine, if you affect uh, EU growth rates, would that help justify lowering the, you know, the reserve rate from point, another reserve rate, the interest rate from 0.5 down to, two, uh, down to 0.25 like they've been talking about? Do you think the problems in Ukraine would be enough justification to change monetary policy? IOR, is that 0.25? We're talking about the, the, the ECB. Oh, I'm sorry. ECB? I'm sorry. Yeah, the ECB. I thought it was in relation to U.S. monetary policy. Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that the ECB's view ought to be that the, that, that the issue is not really uh, a monetary or financial issue. It has to do, most importantly, with the supply of natural gas to Europe uh, that flows through Ukraine that Russia can cut off at any time. And indeed, terrorists can sabotage the pipelines. That, to me, is the much more important issue than anything having to do with finance. And what, the, uh, what, what Draghi and others ought to be doing, at least behind the scenes, is trying to push the European leaders, but also the United States, to deal with the issues of physical supply of natural gas. That's the biggest immediate vulnerability that, that they have. I would definitely agree. Seven uh, DOE uh, non-FTA approved licenses have been approved. There's still 29 or 30 pending. We should get them all and you know, approve all of them. But my actual question was, so with QE, we kind of face a QE conundrum. Every time we cut QE, the market panics, investor confidence goes down, the wealth effect decreases. Two uh, meetings ago, we saw the stock market decline 2.4%. And then we stop, stop the stock market rally, rally again. Do you think the best way to end the QE conundrum is just like rip it up like a Band-Aid and just completely abandon it? Or is it a more of a slow taper is what we need to go for? I've had the view for a long time that QE is mostly, mostly about announcement effects on interest rate policies. 
and not about any direct effects on market prices. So when the Fed started uh, QE3 in September of 2012, was it? They, they, the first start was, uh, 80, well, it was 85 billion and initially through the end of the year. <clears throat> and the Fed had been trying to convince the market that interest rates, money market rates, would remain low for a longer period of time than the market had thought. So I have interpreted the QE as being, the QE3, as being rather like a great big good faith uh, payment in a corporate deal, merger deal. If you want to close a merger deal and you want to say that you're really serious about this bargain, you don't put up $100, you put up $100 million, or depending on the size of the deal. <clears throat> so by putting up $85 billion, the Fed was trying to convince the market, yes, we're, we're really serious, that's a big number. Well then, and, and then they extended it in, in, uh, ja in, in December. Well, Bernanke started to talk about tapering in May. <clears throat> and immediately, there was a big impact on long-term interest rates because of the announcement effects. And then you see the announcement effect again with Janet Yellen's uh, two weeks uh, slip during her first press conference. So I think it's mostly about announcement effects. Now, if that analysis is correct, what the Fed needs to do with QE is to stop making or permitting any possibility of perverse announcements. And the way to do it is to put QE on autopilot and be done with it. And then make your announcements about federal funds policy as accurately and clearly as you can, but get QE out of the way. And, and, that, could be done, and that could be done. All right, let's have a, a round for our experts. <coughs> uh, very informative. Thank you. So we'll give you a, a, t a 10 minute break or so, and then uh, we'll get started back with the program. Georgie.